at uh, a few different things. I want to look at first, first I want to look at, um, at Bishop Robert Barron and something he said about the necessity, kind of piggybacking off John Henry Newman, who was a bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, he talks about the necessity of having a living voice in the church today, uh, the necessity of, 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 of papal infallibility. Uh, basically, and uh, I want to interact a little bit with that, and then I want to talk about Stefan Molyneux, and actually not just Stefan Molyneux, but guys of his ilk, Joe Rogan and and Jordan Peterson, and and um, oh, uh, there there are, there are, are are Dave Rubin, uh, several others uh, that we could that we could talk about. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm watching, I'm listening to a one of uh, Molyneux's. YouTube videos is really good on uh, on the fall of Rome. Uh, really insightful, very detailed. It's like two hours and maybe two and a half hours long, something like that. It's very, very good, very, uh, very thorough. Uh, he's got a PowerPoint with it, but I can't. I'm, I'm listening to it as I drive to and from the office, so I can't see uh, the PowerPoint. But I'm sure it's it's great. He's he's going obviously off of his PowerPoint. So, uh, and then maybe. I want to talk, uh, it, maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't, I don't know, I want to talk about a little bit about immigration, this idea of uh, open borders, closed borders, implications for for either kind of, uh, you know, what needs to happen with careful immigration, so on and so forth. Uh, so we kind of have a busy, a busy, a little bit of a busy program uh, this this evening, and I haven't done a, a, a meaty video, at least uh, since, you know, about seven days ago, so... We can uh, we can jump right in. So first, Bishop Robert Barron. Um, if you guys, I'm not gonna play the video because I don't have his video uh, brought up into into the the web source, and it's a long video, and you really need the context. So I would advise that you go watch it. I'll I'll try to remember to put it in the uh, show notes after this, uh, after I record, and that way you can just click on it down there. Um, but you know, it, it's kind of this uh, episode that he is doing on on papal infallibility, or at least it's. It looks like it's actually might be a an excerpt from a a larger video, maybe that he did. And you know, his contention and and most most Roman Catholics' contentions would would collectively be you know that that since the Bible is subject to such a wide array of interpretations. Um, that there needs to be a, a, a voice or a person, an agent on earth that can be the tiebreaker, so to speak. Someone who can uh, authoritatively uh, say, indeed, what the correct interpretation is on any given passage concerning any given uh, church dogma or whatever. And... Um, you know, and and, the, and obviously the claim is is that well the Bible's not living. We need a living voice, by which they mean, you know, we need someone who can adjudicate, someone who can judge the true meaning of the scriptures, and someone who can put to rest this kind of whirlwind of subjectivity that happens uh, often in in places like American evangelicalism, right? Where where there there, there seems to be many many denominations, especially within quote unquote Protestant circles. And, and to avoid that, uh, there needs to be a single voice that, that, kind of, that kind of puts to death the controversy, so to speak. Someone who, who settles, who quiets the storm of interpretation. Someone who's able to lay to rest any interpretational debate and say, this is indeed what, what it means. This is indeed this, the, the meaning of the scriptures. And so, uh, to that end, the, the, the Pope needs to be infallible. Now... Bishop Barron, I think, helpfully corrects the misconceptions of 
papal infallibility. And, and what he says is basically uh, what it means to say that the Pope is infallible is just to say that the Pope knows Jesus in a more intimate way than anyone else does. And so when the Pope is not sinning, when the Pope is, 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 is not uh, spiritually disturbed, but is, 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 is in communion with Christ and, and, Within that context of 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 obeying, of obedience, of of ascending to the authority of the lordship of Jesus Christ, he is prevented from error. Okay, now, and he's prevented from error for the purposes of of making these right judgments concerning what Scripture means. So he's not. Many people say, well, the Pope receives new revelation and so on, and that's really not not what the claim of Rome is. So we need to be fair in that in that respect. That's not what Rome's saying with ex cathedra. It's not what Rome's saying with papal uh, infallibility. All that they're saying is basically, you know, that the Pope has the authority, the God-given gift to uh, infallibly interpret the Word of God. It's kind of this idea given in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, the word of knowledge, you know, I think the word of knowledge there refers to that ability to know infallibly what the word of God says. So people like Luke and Mark, uh, recording the history uh, of redemption, they're able to do so infallibly. When they use the Old Testament, they're able to to use the Old Testament infallibly without error, use it using it rightly for its intended divine purpose. Uh, and so that, that that would be an example of that. Whereas the apostles had both the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge, they're receiving new revelation directly from God, and they're also able to judge the meaning, the the objective meaning of the the Old Testament, the scriptures that have already been that have already been revealed. So, um, so basically, they're saying that you know, in that in First Corinthians twelve verses eight through ten, they're they're saying that. That that word of knowledge, that spiritual gift, that operation that's listed there right after word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, that continues today for the Pope. Whereas we would say, no, that that's that's done. We have a closed canon of scripture. We have no need for that. Um, you know, that's that's superfluous. Um, and 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 the Catholics would respond, well, you need a living voice to judge these things because look, your own your own uh, kind of schismaticism, your your multi-denominational kind of uh, uh, confusing confusing kind of array of of thought uh, is is a testimony to the fact that you need someone to judge these matters for you. Ergo, we need a pope, right? And so um, that would be their argument. Now. This is problematic. It's problematic that they that they assume in their answer that Bishop Barron, especially, and and John Henry Newman, who who Barron is a disciple of, assumes that the scriptures are dead, uh, or that they're not living, and therefore we need some living voice to interpret the scriptures for us. Now, one of the very important things that 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 doesn't carry over into a lot of Protestant thought today, and I think that it should is the analogia fide, or the analogy of faith, which would just basically state the scriptures interpret the scriptures, or the Holy Spirit is the only infallible interpreter of the Holy Scriptures. And the Holy Spirit has spoken chiefly through the scriptures. So we are to interpret the Bible with the Bible, so to speak. And and you might just cap that off by saying, well, the Bible is is living, right? And, and so I would counter Bishop Barron by saying, no, the scriptures, they, that is the living voice. That's the living voice of, of the living God. And uh, he would say, well, no, it's just a document. It needs interpreting. And, and I would counter with scripture itself. Because scripture itself, you see, testifies to this very fact that the scriptures are living. Hebrews 4, uh, verse 12, for example, um, it says this. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, that's God's sight, but all things are naked and open to the eye of him to whom we must give an account. The word of God is living and powerful. And in case you have any doubts as to whether or not that could be the, the scriptures, you know, the 66 books in our case, uh, of, of, of the Old and New Testaments, then turn over to uh, none other than uh, what is it? First Peter, um, 
First Peter uh, 1, verse 23. And it says this, it says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, verse 23, having been born again, not of, a, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And, and that word through, it could just be, you could just say by, you could use the word by, it's dia in the Greek, say by, because of the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because, and then he's quoting from, who's he quoting from? He's quoting from Isaiah. Uh, he's quoting from Isaiah uh, 40 and then James 1, or at least that James 1 is a, is a cross-reference, but he's quoting from Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures from forever, which is Isaiah 40, verse 8. And then Peter says, Now this is the word by which, or which by the gospel was preached to you. Now this, he just quotes the, from the Old Testament, and he says, This is the word... In other words, what I just quoted to you is the word which by the gospel, that's by the good news, this message that's being proclaimed to all the nations right now in the first century, which by the gospel was preached to you. Okay, so, and this word, according to Peter, is living. Now, of course, the the Catholics may may, uh, you know, grant that that language is used in the scriptures and, and try to make a distinction between different kinds of living or different senses w according to which we could understand that. But the point is, is that actually in the context of both First Peter and Hebrews is that this is a living word that's not only living in the sense that it's coming from a living God, but it's living in the sense that it endures forever. It abides forever forever. It remains forever. It stays forever. It resides forever. Those are some other words that could be translated from the Greek word meno. Okay. It abides forever. It persists forever. The idea here is that we do have a living word that we've, the people of God is, they've always had a living voice in the words of the living God. Okay. From the old Covenant with the Old Testament scriptures to the New Covenant with the New Testament and Old Testament scriptures, right? We have the living word of God. So I would counter, hopefully humbly, Bishop Robert Barron with scripture itself. Scripture testifies to the very fact that scripture is the living voice of God. Okay, which where we would get the, the Protestant understanding of this analogy of, an, analogy of fide, analogy of faith, that the scriptures interpret the, the scriptures, right? So we do have an interpreter for the scriptures, and that's the scriptures themselves. Now, maybe the Roman Catholic might come back, someone like Bishop Merritt might come back and say, well, yeah, how do, you, how do you know what scripture says in order to interpret the scriptures? Well, the same objection can just be flipped back to him. He's guilty of the same, uh, he's guilty of the same problem or the same issue, right? Because even the words, we, we, it's just a regress of, of, of needful interpretation because even the words of the Pope then need interpreting, right? Who, who's going to infallibly interpret the Pope once the Pope infallibly interprets the Bible, right? And, and this is part of the reason why there's theologians within the church that have tried to figure out even what Popes mean. Okay, so, so they're, not, they're not free from, from the difficulty. But I think that the I think that the discussion needs to be, be had at the level of epistemology. We need to be talking about epistemology. And so how can the person, how can a, can a person be reasonably or rationally certain that God has said what he has said based on the scriptures themselves? And I think because we also believe in a, in a, in an accompanying complementary doctrine called the perspicuity or the clarity of the scriptures, we can say that yes, the scriptures are clear enough when all of it's taken together, uh, to give us rational certainty as to the intent of the divine mind. I think we can come to relatively certain conclusions as to what God says. Now, we can't come to absolute, we don't have absolute certainty. This idea, I think, what pre, what's presupposed in this papal infallibility and then the, the implied regress, I think, that you can, you can pull into there, is that we are in need of absolute certainty. 
And we're not in need of absolute certainty. Um, and, and daily life testifies to this. For example, you walk out your front door in the morning without absolute certainty that you're going to be met with a fire-breathing dragon. Uh, but you have reasonable uh, you know, you, you have reasonable certainty, you have a rational certainty that that's not going to happen. It's just not, it, something just, just, just tells you that, that that's not going to happen. And, uh, I don't think you're foolish for walking outside and assuming that there's not going to be a fire breathing dragon waiting for you in your front yard, right? So we don't need absolute certainty. And this quest for absolute certainty is kind of a waste of time, if you ask me, because I think we can come to conclusions that give us an amount of certainty uh, that leads us to uh, to to a conviction to 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 uh, to belief and and all of these things. So, um, anyways, I I wanted to talk about that because that's been something that's been on my mind for a while. Hearing Catholics say, "Well, we're in need of a living voice," and I think what they're missing, the unfortunate sad thing is that they're missing out on 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 recognizing realizing and possessing the living voice of God because they don't recognize what the scriptures are and instead they're clinging to the words of a man or of men in the case of histor of their historical theology and their historical dogmas that have been declared uh, by virtue of the papacy and and so they're missing out on the 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 richness of having the Bible and realizing that the Bible is the living voice of God, and and I think they're they're also missing out on the robust defense of the Scriptures and the robust defense of the Christian faith that can come from having a theology like that, because a lot of people have lost faith in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Roman Catholic system as a whole, because of the smoke screens of the the ecclesial leadership, the, the, the smoke screens that the ecclesial leadership has put up. It's, it's rendered the common people, rightly so, uh, it's rendered them uh, in a doubtful state, questioning whether or not these leaders in the church have the capability to do anything spiritually fruitful. Okay, whereas in, 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 in Protestant circles, <clears throat> in Reformed circles, you know, we, we admit of our depravity, of even our remaining depravity, being in Christ, our remaining sin nature. And what happens when a, a pastor or, or, or some kind of an overseer, a presbyter, somebody like that, a deacon, or or a teacher, when, when they commit moral failures, right, and or they teach falsely, it can always be traced back to a, a, a false view of the scriptures. It can always be traced back to an unregenerate heart or, 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 or an inconsistency in their living with what, with what God has said. And so the, the, uh, the teaching... Uh, the right interpretation of the scriptures, so to speak, does not hinge upon the character of a man like I think the, the Catholics subject themselves to when they say that the Pope is able to speak infallibly. I think inevitably what people do is they begin to interpret the Pope's words in light of the character, the general character, and especially now this is a very dark thing because the general character of the Roman Catholic Church is, is very dim. And I would say you know, you have people who are, are seriously questioning their commitment to that institution at this point because of with the sex scandals and things like that. Whereas, say, for example, in, in, in Baptist church polity, uh, each church is seen as a self-governing body. Each individual local church is seen as a self-governing body. So the congregation actually has the authority on the basis of the scriptures to, to change their leadership, if need be, if need be, okay? It's a self-correcting system in every rightly functioning Baptist church. Um, and, and what that does, what that does is it allows the Word of God to be the chief administrator 
of doctrine and the chief, uh, the chief interpreter of itself. You know, when you when you commit to this principle, sola scriptura, that's what you're doing. You're saying that the Bible is sufficient. The Bible is sufficient, right? And we go to commentaries and things like that for for input as to what others think, because we can't look at all the scriptures at once, you know, in an instant and and say, okay, now I can, because the scriptures interpret the scriptures. Uh, by virtue of the whole of the scriptures, right? You, you go to the clearer parts of scripture to interpret the, the, the less clear parts of scripture, and we, and we use commentaries to help us do that and, and, and spot out cross-references and things of that nature. So, so commenta- commentaries are not the chief way in which we interpret the scriptures. It's the scriptures themselves, or it should be. So we have a living voice. Okay. I wanted to go on to Stephen Molyneux and his ilk. And I don't know if we're going to make it to the topic of immigration this evening. I would like to talk about that at some point. Um, uh, biblically and historically speaking, I think it's I think it's important, and I think there are some some kind of obvious things, factors that play into immigration that would be, I think, helpful to 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 everyone to to kind of point out and talk about a little bit. But I want to talk about Stephen Molyneux. What do we do with guys like Stephen Molyneux? Jordan Peterson, uh, you know, uh, day, uh, what's his face? Um, oh, I, I always forget Ruben, Ruben, Ruben report, right? That guy. What do we do with guys like that? Guys who want to espouse conservative, conservative values, but they don't, but they, and they want, and they even, they even want to come close to grounding them in something like Christianity, but they don't. But they don't want to repent and place their faith in Christ, right? Um, and and basically, what you have is is this kind of liberalized approach to seeing everything uh, in the Bible as nothing more than uh, moralistic in value, okay, or 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 ethic ethical in value. It, it, it's, the, the Bible is nothing but a, a moral tool, right? Or the Christian faith, for example, actually, as a whole, is nothing but a moral tool. And you get things like that in like the exemplar theory of the atonement, that Jesus was really just the the example. And that's that's primarily the purpose of the gospel account is to present this person, Jesus, whether he was an, a, a real historical person or not, it's irrelevant. He's, he is an example of of how to live rightly in this world and how to live um, uh, in in a in a socially acceptable manner or a or a a, a morally acceptable manner in in any society, um, and and I think what you're getting is is you're just getting that again. So so my first thing is, I, on one hand, I I don't understand why so many Christians, um. I don't understand why so many Christians see these guys as being so impressive. Okay, so the, there's a lot of Christians, especially within "quote unquote" reformed realms, and and it's just I'll call it pop Christianity, pop theology. I mean, whatever's cool at the time it seems to be what goes. Um, so you get a lot of people like going Presbyterian because it's cool to baptize babies, but then that's not cool enough. So you get people going Roman Catholic because Bishop Barron's over here doing this cool thing, and he's using using media and all that, and it's, it seems really cool. It's like the thing to do. It's more traditional, more, it's more old school, you know, kind of old guard. We want to go there. Um, but, you know, that, that kind of mindset has really exalted these guys like Peterson and Molyneux. And, and, and I don't really understand the draw because there are, there are people throughout the history of the church who were actual Christians, uh, who didn't just, tiptoe in the system who didn't just uh, play with Christianity, but who embraced it wholeheartedly with the arms of faith. Um, there are men who, who have gone before us, who have said m- much of the same things in a much better way and a much more doctrinal, uh, doctrinally construed way, I think. Um, and so on one hand, I, I, I don't get the I don't get the draw, especially especially with Christians. I don't understand why Christians are going out to, 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 to these conferences and things like that, where they can see these guys speak. And and they're and they're, I understand listening to them and 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 learning from them to some extent, but I don't get why 
you get people saying things like, uh, man, these guys, you know, they're basically, they're, they're heroes to even summon the church. These guys are heroes. And, and I don't know why, because they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pagans essentially, uh, if not just atheists who see a, a strictly moral only, uh, advantage to something like the Bible or the Christian system. And so I understand learning from them, right? Because I would read Aristotle or Plato. I read, I read Cicero. Okay. So I, I learn from, from pagans, just like the next guy. All right. There's some good things to be said there. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but to exalt these people, uh, to a position as if they've said something that's not already been said before in better terms, is odd to me. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is I get the allure. I do get it to some extent, okay, because I see the intellectual prowess of someone like Stephen Molyneux. Brilliant thinker. Absolutely brilliant. I've never seen anybody be able to just give like four hours of material. It doesn't even look like he's he's not reading a manuscript or anything. The guy can just talk, right? And he can and he's not just it's not just gibberish. It's not just useless uh, bantering. It's, it is productive, precise, what seems to be scholarship. And so, but it not just dry scholarship. He's, he's, he's relating very, uh, lofty ideas and philosophical concepts to things that are going on right now, right? Some things he's relating language that has, you know, was spoken 2,500 years ago with the pre-Socratics, and the Socratics, uh, Plato and Aristotle, and he's relating those things to, to the here and now, right? And I think that is that's very valuable. And so I, I get the allure. I get that's why I would I listen to that. I listen to Stephen Molyneux every once in a while. I listen to Jordan Peterson every once in a while. Um, I think they have a a a a a command, not only of the English language, but they have a command of. Uh, of concepts and relationships that uh, that is is rare in many of today's circles of talking heads. Okay, so you don't get that kind of thing in the news. You don't get that kind of thing on mainstream talk shows. You're not getting that. So a lot of people are going out to these YouTube channels, and they are getting that. They are getting that rich interaction with uh, philosophical and even theological concepts. And so I, I understand that. That's valuable. That's very valuable. And and the thing I appreciate about like the 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 uh, the intellectual dark web the most is that they're getting people to to use their brains again. Okay, they're not out proclaiming the gospel, uh, but they are getting people to use their brains again. They're getting gears turning again. And oftentimes when that starts to happen, God will use that as a way of 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 drawing people to himself. So, for example, part of the reason the, uh, the Christianity in the first century was so attractive to a lot of uh, a lot of Greek thinkers, I say a lot of Greek thinkers, a, a, a good number of Greek thinkers, I wouldn't say the majority by any means, but but a good number of Greek thinkers adopted Christianity, were, were, were converts, um, because to some extent, what they'd been taught uh, you know what they'd been taught uh, Platonism and then and then and then you know a, a more moderate version of that in Aristotle th- they are it Christianity makes sense and and makes makes Plato and Aristotle make more sense right because Plato and Aristotle didn't have a, a an objective grounding for for their systems so so Christianity was very very attractive to these thinkers so their gears were already turning they were already high thinkers so to speak and Christianity came along, and and to them, epistemically speaking, Christianity was the cap that was needed. It was like the it was like the missing uh, it was like the missing stone that completed the structure, right? Um, and and by no means am I saying that that the gospel is dependent on Greek Greek philosophy. That's not what I'm saying. But in terms of their thought process, the the thought process of the first century Greeks and Romans, uh, their their thinking. Uh, in terms of Plato and Aristotle, and what you have with Christianity is uh, is not a completion of that per se. You have you have 
logical, rational thinking come into its own. Objective, logical, and rational thinking come into its own with the Christian system. Okay, and that's that's that would make sense if Christ is God who created the world. It would make sense if Christian doctrine uh, made sense, so to speak, with logical or was consistent with logical and rational thought. Um, and it was a, a lot of Greeks and Romans thought that way, and 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 they they said this 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 completes the problems that we've seen in Plato and Aristotle. It 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 opens our eyes to this world and and the god of this world and 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 how we are to live in this world right it provided a solution to ethics it provided a solution to metaphysics it provided a solution to to aesthetics even beauty it provided a solution to all of these things and it was totally logical okay so god used thinkers right and 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 in a, in such a way as to kind of cultivate a a a, a people providentially, who would be drawn to something like Christianity. And all of this is in God's providence, him drawing people to himself, okay? It's not a pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of kind of way of thinking. So so there is a value to to secular thinkers, right? If they are if they are at least hitting the right notes in some areas. And I think that's the case with people like Stephen Molyneux and Jordan Peterson, they're they're hitting the notes, the right notes in some areas. the The problem that I see, and the problem that I see with this kind of heroism that's being ascribed to them, is is the fact that Molyneux, Peterson, Rogan, uh, Rubin, uh, uh, Shapiro, you know, name the member of the intellectual dark web you want to name. With the exception of maybe Shapiro, who who may do a better job at this than the others, but I still think he's devoid of it completely. Uh, none of them are able to provide an, an absolute foundation for the 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 ethics, right? That they that they want to borrow from what seems to be they want to borrow from something like the Christian system, and it's almost explicitly the case that these men want to borrow the virtue from Christianity. Which is great. I'm not complaining about that at a very practical letter, level, okay? Because if you if you have people who are pagans living according to Christian virtues, then you're going to have a better society. So there's blessings. There's certain blessings that come from that, uh, you know, based in God's uh, granted in God's common grace. And so that's I'm not complaining about that on a very practical, utilitarian level. The problem is is that they they want to abstract the virtues from the person and work of Christ himself, when it's really the person and work of Christ comes first and the virtues come out from there. So, for example, you're, you're always going to have this regress of society that that kind of kind of does better for a while, like like in Molyneux's presentation on the fall of Rome, you, you have you see, for example, the 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 state that the Roman Empire was in. For many many years, and it was absolutely astounding, even from a modern perspective, because they they had an infrastructure that 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 surpassed anything that had preceded it, and and uh, and in some ways informs a, a lot of what we do now in terms of infrastructure, jurisprudence, and things of that nature. So the the Roman Empire, they were living according to certain virtues that 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 allowed them to do fairly well in this world okay so so in terms of governing people and 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 how people lived in society and it really cultivated an empire that that did very very well so part of the reason it it fell uh however was immigration is is one thing but but the motivations behind the flawed immigration and the motivations behind the immoralities and things like that so these were people living according to virtues and values with no objective reason to live according to those values. So, for example, Cicero says that the chief end of man really is uh, is is moral worth. It's moral worth, and 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 that's a lot better than the Epicureans because the Epicureans were 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 hedonists, right? They were just saying that the chief end of man is man's pleasure and. Everybody should be a pleasure seeker, seek your own, and so on and so forth. And Cicero came along and said, that is ridiculous. No society can can function uh, like that. 
and um, and and it's illogical. For example, uh, you 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 have people whose whose pleasure it is to kill other people and things like that. You get it gets ridiculous. Hedonism does. Um, and uh, and Cicero was saying that the chief end of man really needs to be moral worth. And and Kant said something similar that we need to see men as ends in and of themselves. And the question is, the question is that often comes in 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 latter times in, in questioning these systems when people get tired of them, they grow weary of them, and they want something new, which is always the case because people are covetous animals, <laughs> or they act like covetous animals outside of Christ um, when they should be behaving like imago dei, image of God. Um, they come along, they want something new, right? They want something new, so they so they so what do they do? They 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 want they want to overturn their their society their government and, and and whatever and the reason they do that is because they don't they don't have a there's no objective foundation for why you should see man as an end in and of himself why should you see another person as an end in and of themselves why shouldn't i see me as an end in and of myself uh, rather than my neighbor or whatever. Why not see my desires as an end in and of themselves? There's, there's nothing. Yeah. You could say, you could say, well, well, there are um, various utilitarian effects that, that are, are more readily produced by Cicero's view, right? Which is more stoic in nature. It's, it's, it's moral worth or, or like a Kantian view of ethics where, where man is, uh, other men, men are ends in and of themselves. Yeah, on a utilitarian basis, they produce better effects. Uh, more, you know, pragmatically, it's it's more desirable, or at least they would say that. But why, why, why is it better to to uh, create an environment that's conducive toward human flourishing or whatever, right? So that there's an infinite regress of of questioning. You know, there's no. There, there's no place where the buck stops. Um, there's no reason to think. There's no objective reason to think moral worth is the chief end of man, right? There's no reason to think that. There's no reason to think that uh, we should desire the, the the effects that that stream from a society that sees moral worth as the chief end of man, right? There's no objective reason to see that, and uh, other than it, you know. You could just say, well, well, then your society is going to crumble. Well, maybe I want the society to crumble. You know, there are people out there that want to watch the world burn. So you need an objective basis, an objective framework that you can work upon, an objective foundation, rather, that you can build a, 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 a an objective superstructure upon, right? Because otherwise, you're not going to have the foundation, and you're going to have people come in later and question why you do what you do, why you think the way you think. Now, I'm not saying that's the the explanation for the fall of the Roman Empire. I, I don't think that, that, it, that it is. There's there's a lot of confounding variables that, that went into that. But but virtue or morals or ethics without without a ground, without a foundation to ground them in, are just kind of out there hanging. They're subject to intellectual scrutiny, and I think you see a perfect example of that. In, in in the in the left in the left at our universities for example why do we live according to these customs why do we live according to these values that have so long been espoused within western culture and society why, why live according to those things you see the de deconstruction right because because there for many many years there has not been uh, a strong enough Christian voice, Arguing that these these values that have been so friendly to Western culture, those values they really need grounded in something like the scriptures. They need grounded in an objective source, and that needs to be God. That needs to be the first cause, the prime mover, uh, behind which there's nothing else. You see, right now there's 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 other things behind the moral values. Moral values. Uh, even if you choose to see them as axioms or foundations, um, they don't they don't ground themselves. They're not grounded. It doesn't matter if you call them an axiom. There's still there still needs to be a, a an explanation for them.
You know, you have the principle of sufficient reason. Everything has an explanation. Well, why, you know, explain the uh, the moral values? And what we need is is an explainer that that is able to explain himself, that is explained in and of himself, and that's God. So the, the regress stops at God. And God has an explanation, but his explanation is in and of himself. He doesn't have a cause, but he has an explanation, and his explanation is God himself. And, and so we need that foundation. We need a divine foundation for our morals and, and our virtues. And, and the interesting thing is you don't, you don't really have that with Peterson and, and, and you don't have that with Molyneux and, and other thinkers within the intellectual dark web. Like I said, Shapiro might be one who you would have to reckon with and disagree on more theological grounds with his position. But um, anyway, so that's one reason. That, 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 or that's one observation I want to make. The, the other observation is, is it's interesting to me that you get this tinkering with the Christian worldview. And you want, you want people to kind of live according to these Christian values. And, and you're making your mission really to, to preach, to some extent, these Christian values. But you, you don't, But you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. The idea... The idea uh, of, of, of believing in Jesus, not only as a historical person, but believing in him as the person who he claimed to be himself, which is God in the flesh, to believe in his work for the atonement of sins. You see, all that's very unattractive in academia. And so a lot of these guys, they see the value in the Christian system and they'll, and they'll kind of rob Christianity of its value and use it for themselves, but they will not themselves adopt Christianity as a world view. And what I mean by that is, is taking and appropriating its doctrine, all of it. It's all or nothing. And, and like I said, this, the values, God's law is fulfilled in the person and work of Christ. And so you're you're trying you're seeing these men pull God's law out piecemeal, not all of it, and 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 in principle maybe all of it maybe all the Decalogue is there in principle. I mean they would a lot of these guys Peterson would say I think you need to believe in God I think you need to believe in in God. Now what that is what that is is questionable, right? It's very questionable uh, to him, anyways, and. Um, uh, but but you don't you don't get any of these guys wholesale adopting the Christian way of thinking. You don't get them placing their faith, their trust, their commitment in the personal work of the Lord Jesus Christ and repenting from their sins and placing you know turning toward Christ. You don't you don't you don't get them. You don't get them converted. And what we need to remember with these guys is that they are unbelievers. Um, they are unbelievers who have abstracted some values out of the Christian system, and now they're using them because they see the value in them, right? So they themselves might be living according to them, and but, they, but their hearts aren't changed. Uh, so they're still they're still coming short morally. If there is a God and the God has morals, they've fallen from those morals. They don't live up to those standards. And so they need a reconciler. They need someone who does live up to those standards that can represent them before a just and holy God, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, and so what we have to remember, brothers and sisters, Christians who are watching this, we have to remember that it is an act of God, it is a work of God that converts someone. You see, these guys are attracted to Christianity. They're attracted to the values of Christianity. They're attracted to them. But they don't want Christ. They want the benefits of the kingdom without the kingdom itself. And so what this should cause us to re remember and, and, and this should remind us that it, it's a work of God that a man's heart is changed. It doesn't matter how attractive you make Christianity to someone. They'll, they'll, they'll take it apart piecemeal 
and and they'll appropriate the attractive parts of Christianity to their lives, and they'll live according to them fairly, you know, in a check the box kind of way, maybe. But but they'll, but they'll benefit from them. They'll they'll get the blessings, or at least some of the blessings. But they won't get the chief blessings. They won't get union with Christ, right? Because they 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 have not reached out and grasped a righteous declaration by the fingers of faith. And until they do that, they will never be declared righteous before God, right? They will never be in union with Christ. They will never be partakers of the new covenant. And and so all of their work, all of their desire to make society better and kind of rekindle Western society and, 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 and recover it and preserve it, all of it is futile. All of it is futile because really... 40, 50 years from now, all those guys are going to be dead. And and the next generation, the generation they're fighting for, and in 100, 120 years, those guys are going to be dead too. And the next generation, dead. Next generation, dead. For what? All for what? If it's not of eternal significance, then for what? Right? And that's why nihilism, this kind of idea that life is meaningless, became so popular among atheists, and I think is the only consistent atheistic position that life is meaningless. Right? So if they can't anchor those values that they want to preach, that they want to teach in these universities, which I'm appreciative for, if they can't anchor them in God, in the almighty God of the Bible, if they can't anchor them in Christ, then eventually we're going to have a generation come along and say, well, these values aren't anchored anywhere. And so, nihilism. And on goes the cycle, right? On goes the cycle. Rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall. Rome rises, Rome falls, you know? Um, Britain rises, uh, the United Kingdom rises, it falls. The United States, it rose, it's in the process of falling. Because we can't ground our values in the Almighty God of the Scriptures. Um, now, should I talk about, well... I don't want to go beyond an hour, so I'll try to limit this this conversation uh, to 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 about fourteen minutes, thirteen minutes now. Immigration, immigration. I think it's a valuable discussion to have, and and what piqued my interest was listening to Stephen Molyneux's presentation on on the fall of Rome, the truth about the fall of Rome. I think is what it's called on his YouTube channel, and um, what was striking to me is how he related the concept of immigration to the fall of Rome and what was happening in the Roman Empire at the time of its fall was was a an influx of immigrants who wanted to come in and be part of Rome because they wanted the 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 blessings so to speak right the benefits of being in Roman society but they didn't want the values that brought about those benefits right so the Goths, for example, he talks about, you know, they were being allowed into the empire. They were being kind of squished between Rome on the one hand, and then on the other hand, they were being pushed toward Rome by the uh, the Huns. And so the temptation of the Roman Empire was to to speed up immigration, and they ended up... And and, and also, there was an, the, the other thing was, they, they when they would conquer an area, they would, sometimes they would take... Uh, the conquered people and appropriate them, integrate them into their society as slaves. Um, now, the problem is, is that this, this population that came in from outside, okay, they did not grow up with Roman values. They did not grow up with Roman customs. They were not part of Roman culture. And so the culture was not kind of infused in them from birth, from childhood, uh, but they came in, they got a document that said they were a Roman citizen, and they brought their culture into Roman culture. Okay, so and 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 this is basically a, a crack in in Roman society that 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 uh, helped the fall of Rome because the peoples that came in they wanted they wanted the benefits again they wanted the benefits of Roman society without the values that brought that 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 made those benefits possible. Right? And they weren't bred up with those benefits. And so what you see now in America, right? you used to have kind of an American identity. 
And more and more, as the years progress, we're losing the American identity, which is just Western society, Western the, the, the apex, kind of, so to speak, of, of Western society and what all of those values and things like that that made Western society great. You're, you're losing that identity, and, and, it, and it's vilified to say, well, we think Western society, it's, it's, you know, people are called racist for saying, you know, Western society is superior or Western culture is superior to any other culture, right? Because then we're seen as, as culture elitists. Um, but, but I'm a firm believer that some cultures are better than other cultures, okay? We're not talking about races. We're not talking about uh, human beings in and of themselves here. We're talking about cultures, the way in which peoples live, uh, the those markers that identify uh, those groups, their habits, and so on and so forth, their their religions, their rituals, you know, everything that goes into making a person's society what it is, their, their culture, right? Some cultures are better than others. Some tribal cultures, right, believed in cannibalism. Well, come on. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to say that that, that some cultures are better than that culture, right? And, and, and most cultures, right, are better than that culture kind of a culture where where you see human beings as as actually you know something uh, something that can is, can serve as food right that there are better cultures than that there are better cultures than that that did not that do not stoop to that that level of, of barbarism okay so 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 I'm assuming that that there are better cultures than other cultures okay there there are some cultures that are superior to others. Uh, if you're not talking of, you know, in terms of values, there are better cultures than others. In terms of the results of those values, there are much better cultures than others. Rome is an example of a culture that was at the time better than any other culture around. It it afforded freedom for the peoples, uh, you know, freedom in the sense not to do whatever in the world it was you wanted to do, not not in the kind of uh, kind of the hedonistic sense, but in the sense that you are not being ruled or controlled or oppressed. You know, you're not a slave. You're a free man. That's what they thought. You know, that's at least the Greek definition of a free man. You're not enslaved. You're not being oppressed. You're not being, you're not being controlled by some outside. You're able to be a, you're able to be a free thinker and you're able to, you know. Okay. So, but what happened was when they started to incorporate these other populations, these other populations didn't, Again, they didn't want, they didn't care for the Roman values so much as they cared about the benefits brought about by those Roman values. And what you see now in America is largely the same thing. You have people that come in and they don't assimilate to American societies because they're not expected to assimilate. And what you have are things like Dearborn, uh, Illinois. I think it's Illinois. Is it Illinois? Or or is it, uh, uh, I can't remember, Dearborn, um, Michigan. It's Dearborn, Michigan, right? That's the that's the that's the uh, huge Muslim kind of capital of the United States, and uh, as a result, you have things like that where you get these uh, fissures, right? These cracks in in the in the uh, in American society, where all of a sudden you have another like uh, society governing itself within the United States, a society that's by the way contrary to our founding documents the values of which is contrary to our, our founding documents. So this is an example of some people, Muslims, who don't have any plans to assimilate whatsoever, but they want the benefits of American culture because they can they can get away from the Middle East, the, the dirty old sandbox that has that been the subject of so much fighting and war and oppression and, and, and poverty and things of that nature. They can get away from that. They can come here. They can start businesses, so on and so forth. But they don't want to relinquish their values, which, by the way, are contrary to the values that made America what it is. Okay? So, you know, this is, this is a very controversial discussion. Um, and, 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 I, and I want to acknowledge that. But what I'm saying is that there are... There, the proof is in the pudding. There are better cultures than others. Uh, and, and, and cultures that, that are founded upon biblical values are better cultures than others. And even in a utilitarian sense, society is typically better in even a pragmatic sense 
when it espouses biblical virtues, biblical, uh, biblical, uh, uh, biblical values, a, a society is better off than one that does not. Okay, so when the culture is is uh, kind of growing out of organically biblical values, then you have a better culture. I don't know any Christian that would deny that. You have a there there are there are some cultures that are better than others, and those cultures that are better than others are those cultures which have grown out of right basically for the most part biblical values. The values the value system gives rise to the benefits of the of the society, the culture, okay? And and so I don't think it's unfair to say there are some cultures that are better than others. And I think what you're seeing in the in the United States now is you're seeing people come in, populations come in that refuse biblical values, they keep their own values, and they refuse to assimilate, yet they're wanting the benefits that are brought about by those biblical values and only by those biblical values. And you had the same thing in Rome. And that was one of the contributing factors to the fall of Rome. And so in this debate between, like, should we have open borders or closed borders or whatever, that's probably the wrong question to be asking. Well, no, I don't think it's the wrong question to be asking. I think it's a productive question with some with some good answers. Um, but... The question we should be asking is, is what implications will our policies on immigration have for future generations? And, um, you know, I, and I've had conversations with, with proponents of open borders before, you know, it, it, even, even with some, some who have immigrated here and the, the, the the thing is, is if everyone all of a sudden uh, from a particular different country came into the United States in mass at once, our 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 system, our 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 American system, our economy would fail. It would absolutely fail. And so, and and furthermore, if they all brought their values with them and failed to assimilate to American cult into American culture, then you're going to have failures on other fronts as well. And so the people who want the benefits of American society need to see that it's the values that make America what it is. Rome in its heyday, I think, had like 0.01% population growth or 0.1%. I think it's 0.01% population growth. And it was steady. Right, it was steady at that rate for a while, and and that was good for them. That was good for them. So it's not like they totally, it's not like they totally shut out the idea of immigration. I mean, there still was, uh, there was still a way to come into to Rome. Uh, I'm not exactly privy as to what those ways were, um, but just like there should still be a way to come into the United States, but it shouldn't be this. No population from outside should be able to come in in mass expect to live according to their to pagan values and and then and then expect on top of that expectation then expect to enjoy the american system for any prolonged period of time because the american system the the, the society the benefits thereof rise from the values so if a group of people comes in fails to assimilate dis, refuses to assimilate you're going to have shipwreck you're going to experience uh, societal breakdown, and and we're experiencing it now. We're experiencing it now. You're you're trying to have people force this idea of a plurality of values, plurality of 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 closed value systems, and that is impossible. That is impossible. It's never that has never worked in the history of of empire building ever, where you have a plurality of closed value systems like. Islam and Christianity are examples of two separate closed value systems, right? Um, you, 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 they can't overlap. They can't, they can't coexist. They can't. Neither can Christianity with Hinduism. And Hinduism can't coexist with Islam, right? Because they're, they're, these are, are systems that are tied to their particular religious tenets. 
So you can expect to have this kind of mishmash of values and then expect continued benefits which arose from a particular set of values in the first place. Anyway, that's my spiel on immigration and I uh, I need to I need to stop talking at this point. Um guys, if you appreciated this whatsoever, if this was helpful whatsoever, please Click the subscribe button down below it. Click the bell so that you get the notifications of new content. Also, I'd appreciate a share on your social media outlet. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your evening.